Hello everyone, you're watching Let's Talk About Prepping. I'm Tyler, your host, and in this video we're going to continue our review of this book, which many agree is a valuable resource to everyone, from the untrained pacifist to the special forces operator. Meditations on Violence, a comparison of martial arts training and real-world violence by Sergeant Rory Miller, is an extremely valuable resource to helping both the untrained and the highly experienced reevaluate how they think about violence, and by extension, conflict in general. I hope that you will find this interesting and stick around for the rest of this valuable resource. To continue our review today, we'll be reading Chapter 2, How to Think. If you want to catch up on previous readings, I'll link them down below. But let's get started for today. Chapter 2, How to Think, 2-1, Assumptions and Epistemology. Before we start explaining strategy or tactics, we need to address assumptions. Assumptions are those things you believe to be true without really considering them. They provide the background for much of how you see the parts of the world that you have never experienced. For instance, you can assume that people elsewhere in the world are very similar to the people you know, or you can assume that they are very different. Either point of view will color all of your interactions with and perceptions of those people. Like many things, your assumptions affect you far more than they affect the world. The world is a big place and full of many things. We could not function if we had to deal with each event in our life as a new and separate thing. We will start the car tomorrow the way that we started it yesterday. When we buy a new car, it will start and operate very much like the old one. Assumptions in a large part of our daily life are necessary and usually harmless. We get into trouble when we base our assumptions on either irrelevant comparison or bad sources. No amount of driving a car will prepare you for riding a bicycle for the first time. No matter how hard you convince yourself that they are both vehicles, both just machines, the skills are different. Cars and bicycles are irrelevant comparisons. A bad source would be taking driving lessons from someone who has never driven a car. Worse, would be learning to drive a car from a bicyclist who thinks is the same as driving a car. There is a second condition that must be met before your bad assumptions can harm you. The subject must matter. You can believe anything you want about the best way to approach extra extraterrestrials, or how you would broker world peace, and since it will never be tested, you can believe anything you want with no consequences. Martial arts and self-defense are tricky because for most practitioners, whether they work or not will never really matter. It will never be tested. They can learn and believe and teach any foolishness they want. It will only be a source for interesting conversation. <clears throat> then, occasionally, it will matter very much to an isolated individual. The stakes are high. It is very difficult to analyze your assumptions. In your own mind, there are only the things you believe, the true things. As I wrote above, they are the things you never really considered, because you've never really doubted them. Epistemology is the study of how people and societies decide what is true. What is your personal epistemology? What sources do you consider unimpeachable? If it's on the 11 o'clock news, does that make it true? If all your friends are saying something, does that make it true? If it's in Science Digest or Scientific American, do you believe it? If your pastor said it, is it gospel? Sorry, pun. Do you trust your personal experience? Personal experience would seem to be a no-brainer, but very, very few people will trust their own experience against the word of either many people or a single expert. One of my coworkers is amazing. He's a hell of a nice guy and hell itself in a fight. Huge, strong, and not completely sane. We were taking a course in a personal protection system, and the instructor was describing a straight blast technique, where you applied chained punches to the face with aggressive forward movement. The instructor was very good, a very charismatic young man who had been training for years but didn't have a lot of experience in our environment. The instructor explained how, under a straight blast, the threat will retreat. My friend said, but what if he doesn't? What if he steps in? I thought, brother, the last guy who moved in on you and stabbed you, you lifted him up in the air and slammed him down so hard you broke his spine. Why the hell are you listening to this guy when you have more experience than him and everyone he knows combined? 
but my friend, this truly amazing survival fighter, had completely set aside his own experience because this instructor was an expert. Even when you develop a belief based on personal experience, you are influenced in subtle ways. Rarely, if ever, is personal experience the sole basis of a belief. As an example, most people believe that the sun will rise tomorrow. If you question them, a good percentage of them will say that this belief is based on personal experience. It seems reasonable to believe that if the sun has risen every day of your life, it will continue to do so forever. However, since the same people have awakened every morning to observe this have also awakened, isn't it equally reasonable to believe that since you have woken up every day of your life, you will continue to do so forever? Yet very few people think that they are immortal. My wife says, we're immortal so far. The best advice in this book will serve to enrich your life more than it will contribute to your survival. This is one of those bits. Examine your own epistemology. Look at your beliefs and the source of those beliefs. Some of your beliefs came from early training or bad sources. Some of your sources were chosen because you knew they supported your pre-existing point of view. Look very deeply at those sources that you accept without question. As you do this, it will allow you to see many things that you have thought of as true as merely opinions and give you great freedom in exploring and understanding both your world and other people's. Because of the nature of this book, I want you to apply this concept first to violence. Violence for most of us is unknown territory. Though martial artists have studied fighting and everyone has been raised in a culture where stylized violence is everywhere, very little of what we know is based on experience and very much is based on word of mouth. It is, for many people, entirely assumption. If the source of information is good, the martial artist may be able to defend him or his, herself with the skills. If the source is bad, the skills taught can actually decrease survivability. I want to be very clear here. What you have trained in and been taught is word of mouth. Until you do it yourself, for real, you can't evaluate it with accuracy. Experience in the dojo is experience in the dojo. Experience in the ring is experience in the ring. Experience on the street is experience on the street. There is some overlap in skills, some lessons transfer, but a black belt in judo will teach you about as much about sudden assault as being mugged will teach you about judo. In my experience will always be your word of mouth. You have certain assumptions about what conflict is like. If you are interested in self-defense, you will choose a martial art based on its similarity to your assumptions. As you read books or listen to TV analysis of crimes and war, you will subtly pick your sources to mirror your views. In some cases, if a student isn't careful or becomes enamored of the system or instructor, he will ignore real experience if it doesn't match his assumption. John has studied two martial arts and has been in several encounters. He considers one of his martial arts unrealistic and worthless, largely because he fights so much harder sparring in his new grappling system. Yet, studying his old worthless style, he was surprised and responded with, of all things, a kick to the chin. The threat was taken down in under a second with no harm to John. After studying his new style for some time, he chose to interfere in a conflict between a biker and someone who owed the biker money. John got stomped pretty bad. He feels it would have been much worse if he had stuck with his original martial art. Despite his own experience of a perfect fight, one move, complete takeout, and a bad one, John likes his new art because the sparring feels more like he imagines a fight should feel. It matches his assumptions and, like many people, his assumptions override reality. If you study a formal martial art, there is another set of assumptions that you must deal with. The assumptions of your style. The first major assumption is a belief in what a fight is and looks like. The second is what defines a win. For the old style of jiu-jitsu that I study, the assumed opponent was an armed and armored warrior. The assumed environment was a battlefield full of armed people. The assumed situation was that your weapon had been dropped or broken suddenly, and the assumed goal was to get an opponent's weapon, probably by killing him. This list of assumptions drives almost everything in the style. It forces a close, brutal, quick, and aggressive concept based entirely on gross motor skills. Most styles and instructors are remarkably well adapted to getting the win in the right kind of fight, and crippled when the fight doesn't match their expectation or when the conditions of a win change. Every style is for something, a collection of tactics and tools to deal with what the founder was afraid of. 
a style based on the founder's fear of losing a non-contact tournament will look different, even if it is just as well adapted for that idea of a fight as my jujitsu is for its time and place. Understand thoroughly what your style is for. Violence is a very broad category of human interaction. Many, many instructors attempt to apply something designed for a very narrow aspect of violence, such as unarmed dueling, and extrapolate it to other incompatible areas, such as ambush survival. My jujitsu, for instance, is wonderfully adapted to close-range medieval battlefield emergencies. From there, it is a fairly easy stretch to predatory assault survival, but difficult to adapt to either sparring or the pain compliance slash restraint level of police defensive tactics. Each instructor also has assumptions based on his or her experience, training, and too often television and popular culture. At a seminar, I met a martial arts instructor of great skill and his specialty. Under the right circumstances, he could dodge and send people sailing with very little effort. It bothered me because the operative concept was under the right circumstances. If someone rushed him from at least two long paces away and flinched past their own point of balance, his techniques would work, otherwise not so well. They didn't work generally on the other instructors there, and he had brought his own students so that he could demonstrate successfully. I don't think this was conscious. I met the instructor and talked with him. I genuinely liked and respected him. I believe that in his own mind, his techniques did work on the other instructors. If they didn't, he attributed it to our vast skill. I don't think for a second that he realized that he had taught his student to flinch in a certain way so that the techniques would work. The two long paces bothered me more because he espoused that attacks happen exclusively at that range, and they don't. He set me at that distance and asked how I would attack. I smiled, walked up, put an arm around his shoulders, and fired a knee into his thigh. He laughed and said, I'd never let you get that close. He just had. Without a beat, he turned back to the lesson. He had superb skill, and he, or his instructors, had rewritten the map of the world so that the techniques would work. Since the techniques required two paces, attacks must come at two paces, right? Otherwise, the techniques would have been designed differently, right? Imagine studying something for a decade or more that you will never actually use. You have worked to perfect it, but without a touchstone to reality, how do you know what perfection looks like? He told me about a serious assault he had been subjected to. It was bloody and messy, an ambush at close quarters with lumber and boots. It didn't happen at two paces or from the front. The two he could see were closer than he believes he would ever let anyone get, and he didn't see the third. I assume that sometime after this incident, he found his martial art, fell in love with it, and found great comfort and a feeling of safety in its practice. Does he ever think about that attack within the context of what he teaches? How do illusions become so powerful that they seem more real and affect beliefs more than in an event as horrific as the one he experienced? The assumptions of his style and his respect for them were able to outweigh a brutal and critical personal experience. That is powerful and very, very dangerous. Section 2.2. Two, the Power of Assumption some of our assumptions are so closely held that we will cling to them even in the face of overwhelming evidence. Many, many people discount their own experience as an aberration, preferring to trust in common sense or tradition or the word of an expert. I've caught myself doing this. I've had five real encounters with knife-wielding threats, sort of. The first was downward stab at my shoulder from a teenage girl that I blocked and arm-locked easily, so that doesn't count, right? It was too easy, not the scary and desperate situation I've trained for, and it was only a girl, and only a pair of scissors. The second was a straight-up assassination attempt. A somewhat unbalanced relative tried with all her might and speed to put a steak knife in my kidney from behind. I'm only alive because I saw a reflection, and my body acted immediately and explosively. Was it a real knife defense if I am aware that I'm only alive because of luck? The third was in a casino in Reno. I was ordering a bum who had been stealing credits from other customers to leave, and he pulled a knife. I stayed calm, hands up, and continued moving towards him, keeping my voice calm. I knew that my legs were slightly longer than his weapon range, and I was fully prepared to kick as soon as the critical distance was reached. It wasn't going to be a friendly sparring kick either. I was going for a 40-yard punt. 
With each step forward that I took, he took one backwards until he was out of the casino. It never went to combat. Does it count? The fourth was searching a fresh arrestee in booking. He was a little drunk, his cuffs were off, and he had his hands on the counter facing away from me for the pat search. At the base of his spine, there was a roughly cylindrical shape under his shirt. I thought knife at first, but when I asked him what it was, he said, let me show you. And he spun, reaching under the shirt exactly the same way I'd practiced to draw my weapon from under my jacket. He never got it out. Knife or gun, I didn't know and didn't care. I hit him as hard and fast as I've ever hit a human being, driving his head into the wall, the counter, and sweeping his legs from under him. His head hit three hard surfaces, wall, counter, and floor, in about a second. If he never got a chance to draw, was it really weapons defense? If I thought it was a knife and it was only a cigarette lighter, does it count? The last should have been ugly. A freak on PCP was placed in an isolation cell in reception. With his fingers, he pulled six concrete screws out of the wall to get access to the stainless steel mirror. He then broke the steel mirror in half so that he would have one shank in each hand. On duty, staff sprayed him with five large canisters of pepper spray, and he didn't even shut his eyes. So they called us, CERT, Corrections Emergency Response Team. We handled it without a problem. Does it count as knife defense if I was dealing with it as part of a specially trained and equipped eight-man team? These are all real encounters. Any of them could have ended my life. But because they don't fit my assumptions, because they don't look like the picture I have in my head of a knife fight, I sometimes downplay the lessons I've learned, and this is a danger. Lessons from life are gifts, and they should not be ignored. One of the reasons that it is hard to find an experienced instructor for real violence is that it is hard to survive enough encounters to learn what worked and what didn't. As odd and weak as I sometimes see these experiences, how many experts in bladed weapon defense have had five or more encounters? Five is a very large number in this field, but would you train for a kickboxing tournament under a coach who had only five matches? Especially if he freely admitted that of those five, he cheated on two, got lucky on one, had an opponent back out, and won the first against an opponent below his weight class? Hell no, but in this field, five is a lot of experience. Sometimes it's not only discounting real experience, but taking experience from bad sources and labeling it truth that can mentally cripple you. One of my students was concerned that she couldn't hurt a large man. I told her to imagine a 200-pound man holding a small cat. Could the man kill the cat? Sure. Now imagine I throw a bucket of water on them. What happens? The cat goes berserk and starts scratching the guy up. Does the guy let go? Probably. So the cat wins. I guess. Sure. So you're telling me that an 8-pound cat can hurt a big man and you can't. The cat has claws and teeth. And you don't? She thought for a minute. But I've wrestled with my boyfriends before and I couldn't do anything. Aha. She had taken a situation where she had no desire to cause injury, no fear, probably wanted to strengthen and deepen the relationship, and she had chosen that incident to base her assumptions about combat. Those assumptions nearly made her give up on training. There are fads in the law enforcement community, and we love experts. When the UFC started and the Gracies were winning everything, tactical ground fighting courses started springing up all over the country. They were barely altered aspects of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu or wrestling. Many of the classes I saw showed a fundamental ignorance of the job. Sport grappling immobilizes opponents on their backs. LEOs immobilize face down for handcuffing. Sport grappling takes up space with tight body contact. In law enforcement, at that range, the threat can kill us with weapons from our own belts. The goals of the two are not the same. In many ways, it was as if LEOs were attempting to improve their ability to fly fighter jets by taking lessons from the best submariners in the world. One last story. It is said that when a baby elephant is first trained, a rope or chain is tied around its ankle and it will struggle and pull and fight against the chain. When it learns that it cannot break the chain, the chain can be replaced with a bit of twine, and the elephant will never try to break it. The elephant assumes it can't, and so a full-grown elephant can be held by a piece of string. Many of your assumptions came from childhood. You are no longer a child. Many came from earlier in your training. You have grown and changed since then. Many came from unreliable sources. You can make up your own mind. 
Do not let yourself be crippled by something that only exists in your mind. Section 2.3. Common Sources of Knowledge About Violence We are, all of us, both teachers and students. As teachers, we give our students information. As students, we learn from our teachers. The teachers give us knowledge. This knowledge came from somewhere, from one of four sources. Experience, reason, tradition, entertainment, and recreation. I like experience. It helps to win out the BS from the truth. It allows you to pass on a little bit of the mindset, a few of the tricks, some of the obstacles that they will face. It leads to a perspective that is unique. But realistically, how many instructors have enough hands-on experience in real violence to pass anything along? Very few. The instructors who have experienced enough violence to be able to generalize are even more rare. Additionally, violence is extremely idiosyncratic. I honestly don't know if my experience will match yours. I don't know if our bodies and minds will react in the same way to the cascade of stress hormones. I can't honestly tell you how much of my survival is based on judgment or skill or luck. I was discussing this with one of my students, explaining that unlike almost anything else, the more experience of violence you have, the less sure you are that things will work out. Jordan put it in perspective. Sounds like a case of, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Experience, in my opinion, could not give rise to a new martial art. Given the idiosyncratic nature and the improbability of surviving enough high-end encounters, it would be hard to come up with guiding principles or even a core of reliable techniques. I am painfully aware that things that worked in one instant have failed utterly in others. Decapitating Goats and the Limits of Reason When I was very young, I read a book called The Far Arena by Richard Sapir. The premise of the book was that a Roman gladiator had been frozen in Arctic ice and miraculously brought back to life in modern times. One section stuck with me for many years. The gladiator was ruminating on decapitation. He explained that it was rare that in all his time in the arena he had only seen it done once by an enormous Germanic barbarian. He explained in great detail about the different layers of tissue, the toughness of the muscle, and how things that cut muscle tend to be poor at cutting bone and vice versa. It made perfect sense. I filed it away in the back of my head and believed, without challenging it, that beheading someone or something would be a very difficult task indeed. Years later, I was asked to help a friend butcher some goats. The first step, of course, was killing the animal. We wanted to minimize pain and panic. Cutting throats can work. A gunshot to the brainstem can work, but the other goats tend to get scared and harder to control. I'd been practicing with sword for years. Both the owner of the goats and my wife write fiction of the sort where details on beheading might be useful. I volunteered to lop the goat's heads off. Mary held a rope and the goat pulled against it, stretching its neck nicely. I used the sword my wife had given me for our first anniversary, a single-edged hand-and-a-half forged by cord. The far arena, firmly in my mind, I prepared for a power stroke. All of my skill and all of my power, the sword went through the neck like it wasn't there. In all the animals we butchered that day, I only felt any resistance once. We didn't use the rope, and I did a backhand horizontal stroke. That goat died instantly with its spine severed, but the blade didn't go all the way through the front of the neck. Later, there is a stage in the butchering process where you normally use a saw to cut the spine in half lengthwise. Mary started the job, but the dead animal was floppy and hard to work with, so I volunteered to finish it with the sword. Without a stroke of any kind, just letting the weight of the blade fall off my shoulder, the steel went through about 18 inches of bone. Hope that wasn't too gruesome for you. Here's my point. Just because something makes perfect sense doesn't mean it is true. Reason is weak. Most people don't recognize the sheer chaos of survival fighting or the effects that the stress hormones dumped into your bloodstream will have. Seeing a need for training in this arena, instructors have a tendency to look at an area they are familiar with and extrapolate it to violence. Many take competition experience or other people's research and try to figure out what should work. Things that should work don't all the time. I've been completely unfazed by a crowbar slamming into the back of my head and been left dizzy and puking for three days by a light slap, also to the back of the head. 
I couldn't have reasoned that out. Reason has given rise to a number of martial arts styles, or perhaps fantasy masquerading as reason. There are two ways reason can be applied to any particular aspect of the matrix, such as self-defense. Most people and organizations plan from a resources-forward model. Basically, they look at what they have and figure out what they can do with it. The equivalent in martial arts would be to say, we're really good at kicking and can punch a little. How do we use that in an ambush? Goals backwards looks at the problem and then creates the resources. What do I need to do and what do I need to get to accomplish that? There's no real martial arts equivalent of this thought process. The self-defense equivalent is to ask, what does a real attack look like and what do I need to have a chance? Look at what you need, not what you have. Then you gather what you need instead of trying to stretch resources where they were never meant to go. In theory, there is no difference between theory and reality. In reality, there is. Reason, by itself, is only theory. Tradition. Often we don't respect the environment that spawned the old combat arts. There is, in my opinion, a persistent myth that we live in the most dangerous and lethal era in human history. Surely our weapons and delivery systems are more powerful, but our perception of the value of life has far outstripped our destructive abilities. For generations raised like I was on the myth of the destructive, wanton, killer man, this will be a hard sell. For 2002, the Bureau of Justice Statistics put the murder rate at 6 per 100,000 the lowest rate seen in at least 30 years. Overall violent crime was 25.9 incidents per 1,000. This has shown a steady drop since 1996, as far back as I was willing to go with some slow loading tables on their website. I don't know whether those numbers seem low or high to you. In early 1945, the Battle of Iwo Jima lasted 35 days and resulted in 26,000 dead, combining both sides. The combatants used artillery, bombs, naval guns, and the most significant sophisticated personal weapons available at the time, rifles, machine guns, flame throwers, and grenades. In 1600, the Battle of Sekigahara resulted in about 40,000 dead in six hours. The battle was fought with horses and the most sophisticated personal weapons of the day, swords, spears, bows, and muskets. It is estimated that the total civilian and military deaths of World War II would be around 50 million people. This was a war where the major industrial nations of the earth fought a war of attrition to the bitter end, a war where nuclear weapons were developed and used. It is also estimated that using bow and spear and sword, the Mongols conquered northern China between 1210 and 1240 at the cost of 40 million lives. But they also conquered Russia and the Middle East, another 10 million, perhaps a million in the sack of Baghdad alone, and another 5 million conquering southern China from 1250 to 1280. Do we really believe that the serial killer is a modern phenomenon? Modern serial killers don't approach the body counts of Elizabeth Bathory, who may have killed and bathed in the blood of 600 young women, or Gil de Rey, who was, a bit, who was eventually executed for the torture, rape, and murder of 200 more or less young boys. What is different today? A countess could not hide behind her nobility, and it is difficult and rare to say that peasants don't count. We have a computer network that helps us know if a murder is part of a larger pattern. We have a media that reports what happens. At the turn of the last century, if someone were killed in your town, no one outside of your county and the relatives would even know, unless it made excellent news, like the Lindbergh baby or the Lizzie Borden axe murders. We also have the police. The idea was a new concept in the 18th century. The U.S. Marshals Service was founded in 1789. Scotland Yard was founded in 1829. Think about the implications. If you were killed, unless your friends or family sought vengeance, there would be no investigation, no search for justice. You would be forgotten. The killer would move on. Many of these killers lived and worked in bands, sometimes gangs, but sometimes agents of authority. The press gangs beat and kidnapped citizens to recruit for the British Navy. The soldiers of the Hundred Years' War, the Thirty Years' War, and much of the Napoleonic era roamed the countryside supplying themselves, which means robbing, raping, and killing for anything that they wanted or needed. 
the largely unarmed citizenry had no recourse to any higher authority. This is the environment and the context in which the older martial arts arose. It was an answer to a primal understanding of violence, something we often miss without the experience to understand and evaluate it. Anything that is taught becomes tradition, even a tradition of questioning traditions. Students have a right to know which of their lessons are based on experience and which on reason. Do you even know if the techniques you learn and teach have actually been used? If a martial arts style goes through several generations of teachers without combat experience, will the guesses of the many teachers come to wash away the hard-won experience of the few? Will the rhinoceros become the unicorn? Entertainment and Recreation Too many people, students of martial arts, concerned citizens, self-defense experts, and rookie officers learn most of what they think they know from television, movies, or sports events. The purpose of all of these venues is to entertain, not to educate. What they show has been modified to look more interesting. The long, complicated fight scenes of a Hong Kong kung fu flick are just as unrealistic as the wire work and flying. In a lethal fight, one party has the advantage or gets it as early as possible and impresses it to the quick, brutal end. It's fast. There's very little drama. Rookie officers come to the academy believing that the right way to make a fast entry is with their weapons right next to their heads, pointing at the sky. A technique that only existed so that a cameraman could get the star's face and a gun in the same picture has become something that people who know better try to do. In real life, it is a matter of an instant for a bad guy to grab the barrel and shove it under the officer's chin. A messy death. Each piece of a well-choreographed movie fight scene is designed to entertain you. The distancing lets the techniques show to best effect. The timing is designed for drama, rhythm, and pacing, not for finishing things. The choice of techniques showcases the actor's flexibility. In combat sports, three major factors make it difficult to extrapolate from the ring to uncontrolled violence. The most critical and hardest to train for is surprise. You know if you have a tournament next Saturday. You know if your club practices free sparring on Monday and Wednesday night. You do not know when, if ever, you will be attacked. You cannot warm up for it or stretch or eat right or get enough sleep. The second factor is similar. You know what is likely to happen in a combat sport. You know how many opponents you will face and what size they are and whether they will be armed. You know what the footing and lighting will be like. Rules and safety considerations are the third factor. Some rules are instituted for safety. Most grappling styles don't allow finger locks or strikes to the brainstem. Other rules are based on increasing the entertainment value of the art as a spectator sport. Cops pin face down. The samurai used to pin face down and finish things off with a knife in the back of the head, but wrestling and judo pins face up because it makes for a better fight if your opponent can use all of his or her weapons. Section 2-4. Strategy Training Goals dictate strategy. Strategy dictates tactics. Tactics dictate techniques. Goals differ in different situations. Real violence is a very broad subject and no two encounters are the same. What is a win in one situation may not be in the next. The goal is how you define the win in that particular encounter. Sometimes it will reflect your martial arts training. An incapacitating blow may be what you need but sometimes the goal is to break away or create enough space to access a weapon or just get enough air to scream for help. If the goal changes, so does everything else. If you have only trained for one goal, like submission, you will be hampered when the goal is different. If you teach martial arts, start putting your students in situations where the goal is non-standard, such as escaping from a small room or car, drawing a weapon from one of several opponent's belts, or getting to a dummy phone and punching in 911. One of the simplest drills is breakthrough, where the students must, as fast as possible, get through a door blocked by two opponents. Fighting each or both of them takes too long. The goal is what needs to happen. Parameters are what need to not happen, what you can't do. For me, departmental policy and procedure sets the limits most of the time, but it may also include not leaving someone behind, not losing a weapon from your belt, or any number of limitations. A parameter too few self-defense instructors address is not getting sued. Goals and parameters combine to dictate strategy. 
Strategy is the general plan for accomplishing the goal. Fight, run, and hide are the three classic survival strategies. In the martial arts, do damage is the core strategy of karate. Disrupt balance is the strategy of judo. Individuals and even animals have their own strategies. A wolf pack's goal is meat. The parameter is not getting too injured to survive, acquiring the meat. So they choose the weakest animal in the herd, the one least likely to kick effectively. They try to find the weak one when it is isolated from the others, and then they try to make it panic and run it to exhaustion, nipping their victim as it tires to weaken it further. Some people do this too. Some animals and some people wait in ambush. Some technical fighters wait for their opponent to make a mistake that can be exploited. Some sucker punchers try to distract their victim's attention before they strike. The goal of a quick victory and the parameters of minimal casualties and the real lack of a parameter in cost and material result in the military strategy of shock and awe. Strategy and environment dictate tactics. Tactics are the how of implementing strategy. Environment here is used in a very broad sense. Availability of weapons, targets, escape routes, as well as lighting, footing, and space are all elements of the environment that will affect your choice of tactics, as does the information you have and available time. A SWAT team in a hostage situation will have a general strategy. Set up a perimeter, gather intelligence, hope, neg hope negotiations go well, and be prepared to make an entry if the hostage takers start killing the hostages. They will choose tactics based on the situation, whether to attempt a stealth entry, a dynamic entry fast, or an explosive entry, literally using explosives to blow their way in. In addition, they will have set up a hasty plan, a rudimentary set of tactics for entering and saving hostages if the criminals start killing. While one team stands by to implement the hasty plan, limited time, limited, limited information, other elements are working on a better plan, using the time available and any information they can develop. Tactics and the totality of circumstances dictate the specific technique you will use. Totality of circumstances is the law enforcement term for all of the infinite details of the moment that influence a decision, whether you will use a punch or a kick, for example, or a jab versus a cross. Some examples. Goal, stop bad guy from hurting me. Parameters none, strategy fight. Environment, sticks available. Tactic, hit him with a stick many times. Totality of circumstances, bad guy's hands are low. Technique, snap to the exposed temple. Goal, stop bad guy from hurting me. Parameters, afraid of getting sued. Strategy, get away. Environment, exit available. Tactic, run. Totality of circumstances, Exit on other side of bad guy. Technique, fake left, run right, sprint. Goal, prevent two teenagers from attacking. Parameters, limited time. Strategy, get help slash discourage, discourage them. And environment, cell phone, and no bystanders. Tactic, call for help. Totality of circumstances, they can hear you and seem uncertain. Technique, Dial 911 and loudly ask for police assistance. <clears throat> Goal, not be killed by two hostage takers. Parameters, none. Strategy, run at first opportunity. Environment, nine hostages, large building. Tactic, watch for distraction and go. Totality of circumstances, threats arguing between themselves. Technique, sprint when the argument gets heated. If your goals or parameters change, so does everything else. Different situations require different ways of moving, thinking, and acting. Everything changes. Striving for perfection of a single goal, the hallmark of dojo training, is far too narrow for real life. Section 2.5. Goals in Training In the reception line drill, one student is told that he has been elected governor and is attending a formal ball held in his honor. The party will start a reception line where the governor shakes hands and greets each of the attendees. It is a very important ball and can't be canceled, even though security believes someone will attempt to assassinate the governor. The other students line up while the governor has his back turned. One of the students in line is given a training knife. 
The governor then turns and the line moves past him, shaking his hand, hugging, starting small talk conversations. This continues until the assassin strikes. The attack may come while the governor is shaking hands, after the assassin has passed or when the line is over and everyone is milling around. There may be no attack at all, especially if the student playing the governor can't act natural but seems paranoid and jerky. I have seen some excellent martial arts when I use this drill at seminars, but I've seen terrible self-defense. After everyone has been through, the chewing out lecture is almost rote. It's not easy to be friendly and flip the switch, is it? There was some good technique, good job. There was some bad thinking, though. Did anyone think to yell, he's got a knife? Or yell for help or tell someone to call the police? Did anybody try to run? There's a damn door right there. This is a dojo, for Christ's sakes. There are mirrors everywhere. Did anyone use the mirrors to see who had the knife or take a weapon off the wall? Each and every one of you handled this like martial artists at a demonstration. Not one of you acted like someone who had to stay alive. A quick and dirty guide to not being successfully sued. The legal essence of self-defense is that you are required to use the minimal level of force which you reasonably believe is necessary to safely resolve the situation. Minimum level of force. This will tie into other things in the statement, but if you can solve it with a push, don't use a brick. If you can solve it with a punch, don't use a club. If you can solve it with a club, don't use a knife. Knives and guns in many places are interchangeable. Both are considered deadly force. Some manufacturers make knives with brass knuckles attached or designed so that they can be used, opened or closed, as impact weapons or to grind pressure points. Be aware that in many, if not most, jurisdictions, even if you do not use it and have no intention of using it as a lethal weapon, it is still legally considered a lethal weapon. In other words, if you use the handle of your knife to poke a pressure point, the legally operative concept is that you have used a knife. No matter how you use it, you must be able to justify deadly force. The minimum level of force will change in the course of an encounter, sometimes every second. If the threat runs or goes unconscious, stop. You're done. He no longer presents an immediate threat. Reasonably believe simply means would whatever you did be outside the box for another citizen with similar experience and training? If you punch a child who won't stop crying, you're outside the box. It doesn't have to be the same exact technique that each member of the jury would have done, but it has to be within the ballpark. Reasonably believe applies to and ties together minimum level and necessary. Necessary. Do you have to do this? Is it your problem? Can you leave? Should you leave? If someone is trashing your store, it is your problem, and you can justify acting, if you have to. If the cops will get there in time, you will be expected to at least make the effort to get the professionals involved. Some states have a duty to retreat clause written into their self-defense laws that require you to exhaust all available options to get out before you fight back. Usually, it's a good idea anyway. However, if someone else may be victimized, you might not be required to leave to safely resolve. It is not a contest, not a game, and you are under no requirements to play fair or take chances. If you think you might be able to handle it in a wrestling match, but you are sure you could handle it with your umbrella, use the umbrella. This is often a confusing point for civilians watching news telecasts on police issues. The officer is required to handle situations, not at the level in which he will probably prevail, but at the level where he won't get hurt. An injured officer is a drain on resources, possibly another body to be rescued, and certainly not an asset to anyone. The situation. In general, defense of yourself or a third person from imminent harm is legally good self-defense. From that point on, you have to look at state laws. As mentioned before, some have a duty to retreat. Some have a castle law where the homeowner has unfettered rights to self-defense against someone who feloniously breaks into the home. Defense of property also varies from state to state, and some jurisdictions have other regulations that restrict permissible self-defense, such as ordinances banning firearms. Lastly, in order to use force, the person you're using it on must be an immediate threat. In order to be an immediate threat, the threat, my handy law enforcement euphemism for bad guy, you'll see it a lot in this book, 
must exhibit and you must be able to clearly articulate three things. Intent. You must be able to clearly explain how you knew he was going to hurt you, hurt someone else, kill you, kill someone else, destroy or steal property, whatever the situation you need to resolve. Did he tell you, I'm going to kick your fucking ass? That goes in the report. Did he show you, balling up his fist and moving towards you, raising a club and charging, reaching under his jacket where you suspected he had a gun? Be careful, because you will also have to clearly explain why you thought he had a gun. Means. Whatever you feel he was going to do, whatever the situation you had to resolve, you have to be able to articulate that he was able to do it. If someone says he's going to shoot you and he has no gun, he has no means. If someone says he's going to beat you up and you're paralyzed from the neck down, he has no means. Opportunity. If the threat can't reach you, you can't argue that he was an immediate threat. We get cell warriors all the time. Locked behind a steel door, they yell threats and challenges. If you open the door, they curl into a little ball and say, I wasn't talking to you, Sarge. Whatever. However, by opening the door, I give them opportunity. And if one of these scenarios went bad, it would be my responsibility. Be aware that in any classroom or dojo setting, there is a gap between the perceived goal and the real goal. The perceived goal is what you think you are teaching. It may be anything from mastering a technique to learning knife defense. The real goal, the goal the student strives for, never changes. Make the instructor happy. If you give the student a self-defense exercise, they will try to do what they think you want them to do, even if it is not the most efficient way to survive. That is why when you teach scenarios, the students will not go outside the box without specific permission. They won't scream or yell at another student to dial 911 or run away or grab a weapon off the wall. All things they should really do if attacked, because deep down the goal is to give the instructor what the students think the instructor wants. Section 2.6, Thinking in the Moment. Strategy and tactics, assumptions and epistemology are all critical to thinking about violence and preparing for violence. In the moment of sudden attack, however, your brain will change. The way you think will change. The section on the chemical cocktail, see section 3.3, will cover some of those chemical changes. Right here, we will discuss the mechanics of decision making in a violent encounter. <coughs> the OODA loop, described by U.S. Air Force Colonel John Boyd, has become the standard nomenclature for combative decision making. In essence, each person must observe what is happening, orient to the observations, interpret the sensory input, decide what to do about it, and act. This isn't new. I remember one martial arts instructor from long ago who had the four P's. Perceive, present, plan, perform. My sensei taught it as the elements of speed. Perceptual speed, interpretation by experience, the decision tree, and then neuromuscular speed. The basic idea isn't new or even fresh, but UDA has become standard. Clarifying example. Oh, you see a fist suddenly growing larger. Observe. Oh, hey, that must mean it is getting closer. I'm being punched. Orient. D. What should I do about it? Block or duck? Duck. Decide. A. Duck. Act. I was taught these as the elements of speed with a caution that reactive moves such as blocking rarely work because the bad guy is on step four when his action triggers your step one. His act is the first thing you observe. Time is most critically lost in the two middle steps. In the orientation step, inexperienced people try to gather too much or too little information. <clears throat> in combat or self-defense, the usual problem is to try to get too much information. I need to know where his good targets and my available weapons are. That is all. Martial artists tend to also want to know how he reacted to their last attack and what he is likely to do next. That's chess thinking, not brawl thinking. Predicting what the threat will do in four moves is useless if the intervening three moves are stabs. The most fatal decision in an ambush is the why question. Why are they doing this? What does this mean? You won't get an answer, and if you did get an answer, it wouldn't help you. But many, many victims freeze right there with the why. Decide is the second time waster. There's a thing called Hicks' Law, which states that the more options you have, the longer it takes to choose one. 
makes sense. I call this the brown belt syndrome. It happens when you have too many cool ways to win and you get your ass kicked while you are weighing your options. The way to grow past this is something I call meta strategy. Again, this is something I've back engineered from the people that consistently make it work, not something I'm reasoning out. The people I know who consistently do well in ambushes or have often beaten the maxim that action is faster than reaction have one thing in common. They have a group of techniques that form the core of their strategy that they do not see as separate techniques. Mac has hundreds of disarms and counterattacks, but when he is surprised, he defangs the snake. He can and will do it in a hundred different ways, but in his mind, it's just one thing. James does damage. Again, hundreds of techniques that are all one thing in his brain. I take the center. Operant conditioning, see section 5-4, is critical in self-defense because it is possible in certain situations, including surprise attacks, to cut out the middle two steps and develop an automatic reflex level response. Two or more people in conflict have their OODA loops activated and they feed off each other. My actions are your observations. When what you observe changes, you must reorient. If I can conclude my loop faster, I not only act faster and get more damage in, but I also throw you off your loop. If you start to swing and I hit you in the face, most people will stop their swing to reorient. The closer the events reflect previous experience, the less time it takes to orient. If the event is completely new, such as a judoka experiencing his first leg lock, it is effectively invisible. There is nothing in the past to orient to, which explains the effectiveness of judo in 1888, jiu-jitsu in America in the 1920s, karate in the 50s, and Brazilian jiu-jitsu in the 90s. This is also the purpose of cognitive interrupts or context shifting, doing something such as blowing a kiss or drooling that doesn't compute as a fight. In short, you can attack the OODA loop as well as attacking the body. Exploiting the OODA loop. One, people lock up on novel observations. If you observe something and can't tell what it is, a giant carnivorous tomato with tentacles or someone clearing his throat preparing to spit to open combat, you can't orient to it, so you can't decide or act. Someone commented that people are never brave, read decisive, in conditions of uncertainty. One of the goals of training must be to expose yourself to the widest variety of situations possible to prevent this. Two, you must be able to act with partial information. You will never have all the answers or know what exactly is going on. People who wait for too much information before acting get hurt. The speed of your OODA loop depends on your comfort level of information. Three, the person with a plan or an internal map of what is supposed to happen will have a hard time orienting if the plan isn't followed. The attacker who has chosen a small female may have laid a detailed plan. He will grab her by the hair, and when she screams, he will slap her, and if she continues to scream, he will dot dot dot. If the actual events go more like he grabs her hair and his nose explodes in blood and pain, he will have a momentary freeze as he orients to the unexpected events. 4. Each action on your part is a new observation. The power in a barrage attack or a fast entry in a tactical situation is because the constant action constantly resets the opponent's OODA loop. Observe, his fist is getting big, orient, he's hitting. Observe, his other fist is getting big, orient, it's a combo. Observe, my knee just collapsed, orient, he's kicking too. The constant attack keeps the opponent bouncing between the first two steps, never deciding or acting. 5. And this is wicked cool. This can be defeated by a self-referencing stimulus. Barrages haven't worked on me. Chain punches haven't worked on me. <clears throat> the reason is that when my senses get overwhelmed, I shut down the source of the information. To put it in OODA terms, if I feel myself caught in the OO bounce or sense it about to happen, I attack. The OO bounce has become an observation in and of itself with a simple one-choice orient. I'm frozen followed by a simple decision, hit the bastard, and a simple action, pow. All right, well, thanks for joining in for that reading of chapter two of Meditations on Violence.
A Comparison of Martial Arts Training and Real World Violence by Sergeant Roy Miller. I hope that it was interesting, and I hope you'll stick around for more of this and other types of videos from Let's Talk About Prepping. Stay safe out there, everybody.